Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I know all of your minds have probably been focused a lot recently on the idea of reforming the regulatory process, specifically with respect to new regulations, prospective regulatory analysis. But what about all the regulations that we already have on the books? What about retrospective review and looking back? The fact is the process in America leads to accumulation of regulation, and that's not without consequence. I want to go through some of that today. Before I get into the details, you were handed a piece of paper when you walked in that you weren't supposed to open. Go ahead and open that now, please. Read the short instruction that's at the top. I'll give you a minute to read that. And now you're all eagerly awaiting the second slide. There it is. You also have in that piece of paper a colored card, colored piece of paper. And now I want to know, uh, take that colored piece of paper. You're going to vote with that, although it's not a majority win situation. It's your opinion. Tell me, hold up your piece of paper if you think that is the letter B. Your colored piece of paper. Hold it up in the air if you think that's the letter B. All right. No one thinks that's the letter B. How about hold it up in the air if you think that's the number 13? All right. We'll come back to that. Let me get back to the topic of regulatory accumulation. Regulatory accumulation is the, the it's, a, it's a symptom of a process that leads to the piling of regulation on top of regulation on top of regulation. The agencies and ultimately legislators respond to perceived crises in a way that makes them make a new regulation that will deal with it, but there's rarely any impetus, rarely much incentive to go back and get rid of old regulations that have maybe been on the books for 10, 20, 30 years. And this picture shows you that process. This is the number of pages published in the Code of Federal Regulations each year going back to 1975. Back in 1975, there were about 70,000 pages, roughly, uh, of regulation, federal regulation. In 2012, we had 175,000 pages of federal regulation. So it's just a consistent growth process. There's more and more regulation piled on top of existing regulation. Maybe that's benign, right? Is that necessarily something we need to worry about? I argue that it is a problem. And here's a few reasons why. First, by design, regulations restrict choices. They restrict what people can do. That's how they're written. The words like shall and must and may not that are included in regulatory text are foreclosing some choice that a person or a business or even the government could do. And so by doing that, by foreclosing choices, uh, that's blocking off paths of innovation blocking off possible actions of entrepreneurship. And that has consequence, as we'll see. Second, when people have to focus on following a set of rules that gets really long, 175,000 pages long, perhaps, that takes attention. That takes time. That means that that attention and that time and those resources that are, that are dedicated to complying with rules and following rules or even just reading rules is not spent on something else. So this is a concern because if you're worried about, for example, risk in the workplace and you have some manager of an, uh, an assembly line in a factory who's worried about making sure that every single rule is being complied with, maybe that manager is not focusing on some new or more important risk that could be dealt with if he had the time and focus to deal with it. So it diverts attention away, perhaps, from more salient <coughs> risks, more important risks. And then third, from the agency perspective, if you, if you think that agencies, the regulatory agencies, are able to uh, deal, deal with some risks, are able to uh, address some problems, well, then you should be concerned about the fact that agencies have a bunch of old regulations on the books that maybe aren't effective or maybe are obsolete. Uh, you know, if you have, I used to work at the Department of Transportation, as was mentioned. There are plenty of regulations on the books that the Federal Rail Railroad Administration recognizes as being perhaps not too important these days, but nonetheless, 
they have to train their inspectors on every single regulation that's on the books. That's a waste of resources. So if we could get rid of some of those, you know budget, uh, agency budgets are, uh, are not growing very quickly these days. Agencies would certainly appreciate the ability to use their scarce resources at perhaps a more important risk. So on that first point, I said that innovation can be hindered. That is, regulation inhibits innovation, inhibits entrepreneurship. And the long run consequence is pretty substantial. There was a study released in the Journal of Economic Growth last year that calculated what the economy would look like if we had maintained levels of regulation that we saw back in 1949 and compared that to what the economy actually is now. And this is a graphical representation of that. The actual GDP in 2011 was $15.1 <coughs> trillion. What GDP would have been without, with 1949 levels of regulation is more than three times as large. That's enormous, right? that's huge. The per household income loss that this implies is something like $277,000 per household in annual income. It's enormous. Now, how do you get to such a big number? Let me show you. It's a bit of a, the miracle of, of compound interest, right? Uh, the growth of GDP is a, uh, a process that builds upon itself over time. This is, these two lines show you the actual GDP growth path, which is the red line, the bottom line, and then this hypothetical GDP growth path, the, the higher line that's blue. And this was again calculated in that study I referred to earlier. Here's how this works. At the beginning of this process, agent, uh, rules restrict the choices of entrepreneurs and innovators, the, the choices of firms, it could be governments. And as a result, resources are diverted away from things like maybe building up a new knowledge base, building new technologies, building new innovations. As those are diverted away, the effect is next year, you start this 1949, next year you can't build on top of that new technology. And every year after that, you can't build on top of that new technology. It's an exponential growth process at the end of it that is short, that is short circuited by diverting resources away from innovation and away from development of new technologies. Let me give you a specific example of what I mean. You all drive, presumably, at least have ridden in cars many times in your lives. And so you know that uh, headlights, in America at least, have two states once they're turned on, either high beams or low beams, and nothing in between. Doesn't have to be that way, uh, but it turns out there's a somewhat dated rule from the National Highway Traffic, NHTSA, National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration in the Department of Transportation that specifies that headlights shall have high beams and low beams. Now, there are adaptive headlight systems being manufactured and sold and used in Asia and in Europe that have some sort of mixture of the two. So what's the point of high beams? What's the, what's, what are high beams, excuse me, what's the point of having low beams instead of high beams? It's so you don't blind an oncoming driver. All right, you switch to your low beams when someone's coming in the opposite lane facing you. And that has a good safety reason for it. But at the same time, when you switch to low beams, you're not able to see maybe a pedestrian who's walking on the side of the road. And so there's maybe a safety consequence to it. Ideally, what you want is a mixture of the two, maybe low beams for the oncoming driver, but high beams on the rest of the road. Well, there are systems that can do that. Systems that will dim where the oncoming car is, but then leave brights on for the rest of it. We don't have those here, right? You've never seen such a system in, in, a, in a car in America. Why? It's because we have a regulation that says we have to have high beams or low beams or nothing in between. And so that is a direct inhibition to innovation. That sort of innovation, the adaptive systems, could have been invented, manufactured, and sold in America, but they are not. So let me give you another story that sort of illustrates how all these various restrictions can lead to a cumulative effect, how a web, a nexus of regulations, if you will, can have a cumulative impact, not just a one-on-one -on -one impact like the last example was, but a cumulative impact on, on would-be entrepreneurship. So in Logan City, Utah, over the last decade, uh, city planners, the city government, was considering a project that would involve installing what's called micro-hydropower 
in the, uh, in the river that goes through their town. And this, this, this drawing depicts something like Logan. There was a river there that goes through the city, and there was actually already a pipeline that diverted some of the river uh, and went down through, just like in this drawing here, went back to the river eventually, but there was already a pipeline installed. Now, given that this pipeline is there and there's water running through it, it's got some pressure, what you can do is just put a wheel in there, put a turbine in there, have the, wa have the water turn that wheel, and then that can be converted into electricity. That's called microhydropower. It's a pretty simple process. It's a very environmentally friendly process, right? That's perfectly green energy if you can just put the wheel there without any consequences to the environment. That's what they could do. The building, like in this drawing, already existed. The pipeline, like in this drawing, already existed. All Logan was considering doing was putting a turbine inside that building. They estimated that the cost of this project would be about $1.5 million before they got into it. They learned the hard way that costs can run up significantly as a result of trying to deal with all the regulations that affect this sort of a project. Uh, there were too many for me to, uh, to memorize, so I had to write down a list of the various regulations that they ran into uh, in order to get this accomplished. Uh, they ran into regulations that are all stemming from various acts of Congress, such as the Energy Policy Act of 2005, the Federal Deep Water Port Act of 1974, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Coastal Zone Management Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act, National Environmental Policy Act, the National Historic Preservation Act, the Rivers and Harbors Act, and the Wild and Scenic Act. And those are all just the acts of Congress. Each of those acts will lead to one or more regulations. And so you'll have a, an enormous list of things that you have to deal with in order to accomplish this project. These regulations, for the most part, or these acts of Congress, are designed for environmental stewardship, right? These are mostly the like, National Environmental Policy Act. That's something that's supposed to be green. But in this case, this is a green project, right? This is environmentally friendly uh, 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 energy that's going to be created as a result of this. But the cost of this project ended up more than doubling as a result of having to comply with all the regulations stemming from all those acts. Importantly, all those acts weren't going to do any amount of environmental protection here. The pipeline was already there. The building was already there. There was no amount of alteration to the environment that was going to go on. So this was nothing more than red tape preventing green entrepreneurship. So that idea there is we have this nexus, this accumulation of regulations that can cumulatively have a huge impact. Any one of those maybe wouldn't have been a big deal, but dealing with all of those and together led to a doubling of the cost of their project. And I think it's easy to recognize that that's a problem, especially if those regulations, if those, those, all that red tape doesn't lead to any sort of benefits, as was the case there. There was no amount of environmental protection that came about as a result of all that. So then if you recognize the problem, the next question is, well, why do we continue doing it? Why does this occur? So I'm an economist. I tend to think about things in terms of incentives. It gets me into problems at home often, but nonetheless, uh, I think this is appropriate here to think about incentives of actors who could affect this. First is the incentives of agencies, the, the regulatory agencies that make the rules themselves. I used to work at one, and I've spent my career studying them, uh, and I think it's pretty intuitively obvious to say when an agency has a regulatory program and can show that it's making more and more regulatory programs, that agency is going to expect the budgets to, to enforce those programs or to create new programs. That agency expects to have employees and hire employees when it makes new regulations. In short, as regulations grow, so does the power of the agency. And the people at the top of that agency if they like power, if they like that prestige, if they like perhaps the promise of future income once they leave, we'll be happy to see that that growth occurs. And so there's incentive at the tops of the agencies to support a regulatory growth path as opposed to going back and getting rid of rules. There's also incentive in the rank and file at the, at the bottom level, the economists and the lawyers who are on the teams that make new rules. I don't know if any of you have ever worked in an agency, but you probably are familiar with the, the awards process that goes on in agencies. You get plaques and you get sometimes bonuses for being parts of various projects. Um, those 
typically are awarded at when, when a team will make a new rule. Those are very rarely, if ever, awarded if a team says, oh wait, maybe we shouldn't make a new rule. Maybe it's not a good idea. The creation of new regulations is a measurable output that agencies tend to look at in order to judge their own employees. And employees realize that. They realize that if I can be part of teams that make more rules, then I'm going to get rewarded in my career. So there's incentive even at the lowest level inside agencies to make more rules. And little to none, unless you explicitly create that role for an employee, to look back and get rid of rules that maybe it makes sense to get rid of. You also have to think about where regulations come from. They don't, they don't ultimately come from agencies. They really come from politicians. They come from acts of Congress, that list that I read. Those are all acts of Congress that led to regulations created by agencies, but going back to it, every single regulation has some statutory authority, and that is something that a politician created. Politicians have incentive to respond to visible and present crises. Things like uh, if there's a, a, a sudden food safety scare or if there's some other perceived uh, public hazard that they think they can deal with with an act of Congress, of course, they, they're going to want to do that, right? They want to see that they're, they want their, their voters, they want their constituents to see that they're acting to protect them. It's a very visible and present danger. On the other hand, something like regulatory accumulation and the consequences that it has on economic growth or on safety is much more hidden. It's much less visible. It's a lot harder to make the argument that what you're doing is going to serve your constituents if you're arguing for regulatory reform. So I would say that the incentives of politicians also push towards the creation of new regulations and don't push towards going back and reviewing existing regulations and getting rid of ones that make sense to get rid of. And then third, I want to throw this out there. Incumbent firms, businesses, may actually have an incentive to keep regulations on the books. And so a simple example here is if there is a set of regulations that um, required all factories to install some set of machinery that would maybe reduce pollution, all existing, fa all existing factories comply with that. They purchase the machinery, call it scrubbers on their smokestacks. Once they've done that, they've paid the cost. They bought that machinery. And so now, suppose we realize looking back that that regulation wasn't a good idea. We didn't need those, we didn't need those scrubbers after all. Or there's better ways to accomplish this. Do you think that those factory owners are going to support getting rid of that regulation? Of course not, right? Because they want every new entrant, any new competition, to have to pay that cost as well. They want to keep that barrier of entry. That's a sort of moat around their business that protects them from new competition because new competitors would have to buy similar machinery. So the fact is regulation can serve as a barrier to entry to incumbent firms. And so you shouldn't be surprised when occasionally an agency or a president will ask uh, businesses to tell the agency or the president, what rules should we get rid of? What rules are really problematic for you and businesses don't come up with a big long list? Well, that's perhaps because businesses are protected by rules that are already in place. I uh, recently testified before uh, the House uh, a subcommittee of the House Judiciary Committee, and I was asked this question when I was talking about possible reforms, getting possible ways to get rid of uh, existing regulations that are problematic. Aren't there already processes that do this? And the answer is yes, there already are ways that do this. One of them is through uh, the review that's required from Executive Order 12866, signed by Bill Clinton back in 1993. That requires agencies to occasionally look back at their rules, their major rules, and see if they're ineffective or uh, otherwise undesirable, obsolete. And then there's also the fact that every president, dating back to Jimmy Carter, has had some sort of initiative that has tried to look at uh, uh, existing regulations called regulatory look back or retrospective review, uh, depending on who's, who's phrasing it. Every president has done this, going back to Jimmy Carter. Yes, there are processes. It has been attempted. Uh, in fact, the fact that Bill Clinton did this, uh, had his project go on in 1996, 1997, led by Al Gore called the National Partnership for Reinventing Government, sort of tells you that, number one, that Executive Order 12866 must not have done all that much good because that was 1993, 
And then the uh, look back that, that President Clinton initiated was several years after that. Uh, but more importantly is all of these initiatives, as including Exe Executive Order 12866, are requiring agencies to look back at their own rules. There's no independence in the review. And I would argue that that's going to lead to failure every single time. And here's my evidence. You already saw this graph. There's not really much visible change in this process. Presidents, at president after president after president has said, let's try to fix this. And none has any, had any substantive change in the continual growth of regulation. Here's another way of looking at that same graph. This is the number of pages added to or taken away from the Code of Federal Regulations each year. Going back to 1976, 30 of 37 years you saw pages being added to the Code of Federal Regulations. Seven years there were some subtractions. Arguably some of those subtractions may have been the result of presidential initiatives. The late 90s in particular stand out. That's probably the result of the national partnership that I referred to earlier. And the 80s, that, those deregulatory years were actually most likely the result of acts of Congress, the deregulation of transportation, railroad, trucking, and airline deregulation that were actually all started under Jimmy Carter in the late 70s. But the big broad picture here is in 30 of 37 years, pages are added, and I don't think that that's, that speaks well to the various president's initiatives that have tried to change this process. So, let's be proactive. Can we solve this? Can we, can we come up with something better that presidents haven't done in the past? Can we fix this problem of regulatory accumulation? Well, here's a few guiding principles. And by the way, these are um, outlined in more detail in some of the literature that we have available for you, maybe on your chair already, and there's also some papers on the table outside. But first and foremost, you have to have independent review. To ask agencies to look back at their own regulations and choose which regulations to get rid of is something like if I were to ask my, my students, I'm a professor at George Mason, if I were to ask my students to grade their own test. Some might be a little bit self-critical, but on average you're going to expect them to give higher grades than if you had some independent arbiter looking at the, the tests and grading them. Suppose you were able to get an independent review, say an independent regulatory review commission together, we have to have some way for them to grade the regulations, a systematic process. You don't want to have some sort of arbitrary process to go on. And so I suggest that the focus for the independent reviewers should be on risk and on outcomes. I'll talk more about that momentarily. Third, suppose you have those first two steps accomplished, independent reviewers who are following some sort of predetermined methodology that focuses on risk and outcome, you still have to actually get, once you, you so you, you, you follow that and you get some big list made of regulations that you need to get rid of. Now you have to actually get rid of them. That's a big hurdle. Knowing that regulations are problematic and having even a list does not necessarily mean that you get rid of them. You have to overcome several different groups who have a vested interest in maintaining rules that are on that list. So let me get in, go into some detail on that first one, independent review. There's a model that we can look back at that's accomplished similar reform to what I'm proposing needs to be accomplished here, and that's the, the BRAC Commission model. That's the Base Realignment and Closure Commission. Um, probably several of you know the history of this, but uh, for those who don't, in the uh, 70s and 80s, during the Cold War, there was ex uh, uh, incentive, there was a lot of reason to build up our military capacity and build new military bases throughout the country, uh, throughout the world really. But as the Cold War wound down, a lot of the value of those bases uh, diminished. They had less and less military value. For those bases that were in members' districts, uh, to propose closing them was a bit offensive, perhaps, to the members who had those bases in their districts. The Department of Defense did this. The Department of Defense wanted to get rid of bases that had little to no military value, but they found that every time they proposed one to get rid of, some champion would come, up, come through Congress and say, no, we can't get rid of that one because it's really important for these reasons. It would always short-circuit the process. So the solution 
was to have an independent commission look at all bases and put together a list of those bases that have little or no military value. There was a, there was a system for grading the bases, ba grade them on military value, and then there was uh, an end result, which was this, this list that could be really long, could be really short. Congress didn't know going into it, but Congress was bound to follow the determination of this independent review panel. More importantly, or not more importantly, the independent review is probably the most important portion of that, but importantly, uh, Congress could not, once they got that list from this independent panel, make changes to the list. They were either going to accept what was on that list as bases were going to close or stop the whole thing and not close any of them. There was no in between. Another model you can look at for, uh, for independent review is the, the scientific peer review process uh, that I'm, I'm part of on a regular basis. Um, when a scientist or a, a, a researcher goes to publish his work in a scientific journal, in a scholarly journal, it's blind reviewed, meaning that if I send a paper off to be published, I take my name off of it, and I also don't know who's the reviewer, who the referee is. It's a blind, blind process that makes it so that those who are perhaps my friends or who believe what I believe, can't just make it pass, can't just say, oh yeah, Patrick wrote that, I'm gonna make sure that gets published. Similarly, it, it removes the ability for people who have uh, an agenda that was against mine, perhaps, to, to, uh, to hurt my work. It's supposed to be blind, it's supposed to introduce independence into the process, and over time, I'd argue that it does work. Which takes me back to this. So you were all handed a piece of paper that said you would receive a door prize. Some of you, it said you would receive a prize if this was the letter B. And some of you, it said you would receive a prize if this was the number 13. Now, it's going to obviously be interpreted either way. It's a bit of an ambiguous figure there. But you put some context around it it becomes clear that that was actually the letter B. Or you put some context around it, it becomes clear that that was actually the number 13. The context is important here, and the lesson for the context part of this is agencies view problems within a certain context as well. Agencies are created with a mission, and whatever they see, be it a 13 or a B, they interpret within the lens of that mission they're created with. But then a second part, and the part that relates to independent review here is, what if it's ambiguous? What if it's a 13 and a B? Which, by the way, it's a 13 and a B, so no one actually won the prize because it's both at the same time. Well, if you have incentive to interpret things one way or the other, maybe you're going to act upon that incentive. If you get reward, if there were a substantial prize, if I had promised you, well, I guess there's, there's restrictions on what I can give you because you're federal employees, but if there weren't restrictions and there were a substantial incentive for you to vote one way or the other, maybe you would have. And that same logic applies to agencies. When there's, when there's incentive for an agency to look at an ambiguous finding or an ambiguous result and interpret it one way or the other, you should expect them to, to act to respond to incentives. After all, Agencies are composed of people, and people respond to incentive. So, independent review is key. Now, suppose you could do it. How should you go about doing it? Suppose you had an independent review commission doing it. What sort of rubric should they follow? Here's a couple of tests that I suggest. The first one is uh, what I call the first test of, non -funct of functionality, and that's focused on risk. And there's two parts. In fact, I think probably all important ideas can be summarized in a two by two matrix. So I tried to do that here. And the first question to ask is, is the regulation, is the rule that's being reviewed addressing a significant risk? Significant means a risk that's widespread, affects a large number of people, and has serious consequence. There are rules that maybe address uh, a serious risk for only a very small group of people or maybe even one person, that would probably not be significant. You have to set up some criteria. Or rules that address a non-existent risk for a large group of people or a very small risk for a large group of people, maybe that's not significant either. That's the first part of this test. 
The other part of this test is to look at whether that risk that the rule is trying to address is current. And this goes to the fact that risks change perpetually. What was a risk 50 years ago may not be a risk now. And so rules can become obsolete because they were designed to address what was a current risk, but the risk, risk is no longer current. So the second question is, is the risk, if there was a real risk that's being addressed, still current? If the answer to either of those is no, then you have a non-functional rule. Then you go on to the second test. This one, also broken down into a nice two by two matrix, is the second test of non-functional functionality related to outcomes. Outcomes is key. Outcomes is incredibly important and often ignored in, in the regulatory process. By outcomes, I mean what most people think about as benefits. Regulations are perhaps designed to address some safety risk or some environmental hazard. The outcome, say there's a workplace safety rule. A workplace safety rule that, that, that increases the number of inspections and number of inspectors that go out to workplaces and, and look around for some sort of problem that, that the agency has identified. Those inspections, those inspectors are outputs of the rule, but they're not outcomes. The outcome is safety itself. And so what you want to know, and this is true for both prospective analysis of regulations as well as retrospective analysis of regulations, but what you want to know is whether the rule is actually getting to the outcome that you care about, whether that's some environmental outcome that leads to better human health or some safety outcome that leads to less accidents that affect humans. The outcome is what's important, not the output. So looking back at rules, you want to know whether rules have actually achieved some sort of outcome that we care about. There are plenty of rules, I imagine, in those 175,000 pages of rules that don't have any sort of effect on an outcome that we care about. So put those into the category of non-functional rules if they don't have any effect on an outcome. And then secondly, if they do have an effect on an outcome, another question relates again to obsolescence. Do you have to maintain that rule in order to maintain the outcome? For example, if you got rid of the rule that um, requires that there's high beams and low beams on cars, would that mean that we no longer have low beams on cars? Would manufacturers suddenly stop putting low beams on cars? That's a question that needs to be asked. And if the answer is we don't expect that to change, we expect that safety outcome not only to continue to exist, but to maybe improve because we could have adaptive systems, then you put that in the category of non-functional rules. So focus on outcomes is the second part of this. There's some more details that I recommend in, uh, in the paper that's available, but these are the most important portions of it. Focus on risk and focus on outcomes. That is a suggested, suggested, my suggested way of looking back at regulations to determine which ones we put on a list to possibly get rid of or modify. And then the third point was we have to overcome groups that have vested interest in keeping rules. There's a lot of these. The most obvious one is the agencies. And this goes back to the incentives I spoke of earlier. Agencies have little to no incentive, both at the top level and the employees of the agencies, to get rid of regulations. If they do so, maybe they see their budget shrink. Maybe they see the number of employees they have go down. Agencies, people who control agencies, may not like that outcome and so have very little incentive to go back and get rid of rules. But there's also the incumbent businesses. This also relates back to what I said earlier. Businesses like to keep regulations that they're already in compliance with because that prevents competition. That's another vested interest. That's another group that's going to fight to maintain rules or at least not fight to get rid of them when faced with possible retrospective review. And there's a third group, which is what norm people normally think of as special interest groups. Um, I mentioned I'm a professor. And there's a lot of change going on in the way that education and the contents of courses is delivered to students. Now you can circumvent a school entirely and learn about a subject by going online and taking a course online. So a professor can speak to a million people at once or teach a million students at once instead of just 20. Now I have a vested interest in maybe not letting that change and maybe trying to maintain, that, maintain rules if there are any that require face-to-face -face instruction, maybe to get some certain license or some certain degree, because that means there's more jobs for me 
more availability, more demand for my services. So that's an example of an of a, of a interest group, a teacher's group perhaps, that's going to fight to maintain a set of rules that benefit them. All these need to be overcome if you're going to have successful reform. So you make that list, with, you have the Independent Review Commission make that list following the set of uh, tests that I gave you, and then you have this final obstacle. Well, the way, to, I, the way I would suggest doing this is the way that the BRAC Commission did this. Take that list and send it on to Congress. The Congress doesn't get to amend it, doesn't get to be affected by uh, special interests or other groups. Congress has to just take that list and stamp approval on it or not. In fact, even better, the default should be if Congress does not enact a joint resolution of disapproval, the list is taken as the action that will be taken. That's following the BRAC model. So at this point, I'll wrap it up, and I would be happy to uh, answer questions and have a discussion for, for some time after this. But uh, remember the key takeaway, I think if there's anything to walk away from this presentation with, it's that independent review is absolutely necessary if you're going to come up with a real substantive list of regulations that need to be eliminated or modified. Asking agencies to review their own regulations is not going to get results, and we have evidence of that. Thank you.